Welcome to the fetal echocardiography course for January and February of 2024. This is a fetal echo review course for the ultrasonographers at DCMFM in preparation for the fetal echo boards. All right, the first point is what's, what's the big picture? Why are we learning echo at all? And at least in my opinion, it's to have expertise to accurately tell the patient that the baby's heart is normal if it's normal and have the expertise to find abnormal hearts and begin the process of genetic counseling and consultation with pediatric cardiology. And to do that, it would be helpful if we could figure out to the best of our ability what exactly is wrong. But of all these, probably the most important, in my opinion, is when we say it's normal, it's really normal. All right, so now, what's the point of this actual course? It's very specifically to pass the subspecialty boards. Certainly reviewing it, all this information will improve your ability to do a fetal echo um, and improve your overall knowledge but really the goal is to pass the boards. Now, I believe that all of you in this group would pass the boards today if you took them. I think not much of this stuff will be brand new. I think a lot of this stuff you already heard before, you knew it, you just haven't thought about it for a while. So what we really wanna do here is refresh that information, organize it in your brain so that it just comes more quickly during the test. And if you can have it more organized and fresher in your brains, you'll be more confident. If you're more confident, you'll have less anxiety. So if we can optimize all those things, I think you're definitely going to pass. All right, let's start with lecture number one general aspects. Now this review course is basically going to cover the book A Practical Guide to Fetal Echocardiography by Alfred Abu Hamid. So we're going to start today with lecture one which will include chapters one through four, the epidemiology chapter, the genetics, the embryology, and the anatomy. Let's start with the epidemiology. That's basically talks about statistics about congenital heart disease, the causes, the associations, and so forth. So when it comes to the incidence of congenital heart disease, it's about eight to nine per thousand. But it's just easier to remember, one percent. Of the different disease entities, you can see from this table here, that ventricular septal defect is by far the most common defect. In second place is atrial septal defect. And keep in mind that a lot of these entities overlap. You can have a VSD and an ASD and pulmonary stenosis. But the point is, the specific entity that's the most common is ventricular septal defect. Now, most cases of congenital heart disease are suspected at the detailed ultrasound. So of all the reasons you could want to do a fetal echo, most of the cases of congenital heart disease are picked up when the referral indication is suspected structural anomaly. After suspected anomaly on detailed ultrasound, the other big ones that result in detection of congenital heart disease are a major anomaly elsewhere. So a baby or a fetus gets referred because of an omphalocele. For an echo, that's a time that it's likely to be detected that there's congenital heart disease too. And another one that I guess I didn't think of as being that common is non-immune high drops. So there's high drops, meaning collection of fluid in two or more places in the baby's body, and it's not related to isoimmunization. In other words, um, 
anti-D, anti-Kel, things like that. So if it's not involving a positive antibody screen, it's called uh, non-immune high drops. All right, another indication for referral for a fetal echo uh, that results in a high incidence of congenital heart disease is monochorionic twins. In fact, this estimated risk is about 2 to 9%. So it's kind of a big deal for monochorionic twins. If you think that the overall incidence of congenital heart disease is about 1%, but for monochorionic twins, there's a 2 to 9% chance that one of those twins has something. Besides congenital heart disease, 10% of monochorionic twins, those that share a placenta, get some sort of complication related to twin-to-twin -twin transfusion. And in those who get twin-to-twin -twin transfusion, 10% of the recipients acquire a right-sided obstruction. And then when it comes to monoamniotic twins, which we don't see very often, the incidence of congenital heart disease is pretty much sky high. Well, everybody already knows that diabetes is associated with congenital heart disease. And in general, it's five times higher than non-diabetics. And for certain things like transposition of the great arteries, it's about triple. For truncal abnormalities, it's about five times higher than the general population. And for heterotaxy syndromes, it's about six times as high as the general population. But the really big one is 18 times higher for single ventricle defects. So that's you know the hypoplastic left heart, the hypoplastic right heart. The risk of congenital heart disease associated with diabetes is related to the glycemic control over periods of time. And since the hemoglobin A1c reflects glycemic control over the last three months, the hemoglobin A1c really is linked to the risk of heart disease. And although over 6.3 is considered abnormal or diabetic, when you hit around 8.5, the jump in risk is pretty significant. Another thing associated with congenital heart disease is phenylketonuria, which is an enzyme deficiency that allow, doesn't allow people to process phenylalanine. So the incidence is about 12% of congenital heart disease if diet is not controlled by 10 weeks. Now, controlling the diet means reducing or eliminating phenylalanine from the diet. And phenylalanine's in a lot of foods, and the PKU people learn you know, what those are and reduce them. Obviously, one of the big ones is aspartame, like in a Diet Coke, that aspartame uh, includes uh, phenylalanine. So there's always a warning on the can to avoid that. The one we know quite a bit is IVF and particularly intracytoplasma sperm injection. The chance of congenital heart disease is about two to four times higher, so that's pretty significant. Um, it is two to four per times higher of a relatively low number of 1%. Um, and the ones that they usually involve for some reason is atrial septal defects and ventricular septal defects. Family history, we do echoes for people uh, who have heart defects in first degree relatives, uh, meaning parents or uh, siblings or previous children. Um, and according to Alfred Abuhaman's book, Echo is considered for second degree relatives. All right, now lithium is one that everybody seems to know is associated with Epstein and anomaly of the tricuspid valve. Uh, but probably um, newer information suggests that that's probably overestimated. In fact, 
Alfred Abu Hamid's book puts that into the echo should be considered, not even in the echo is indicated. Anticonvulsants, basically anti-epileptic drugs. Now, anticonvulsant or anti-epileptic drugs are obviously also often used with people with epilepsy, but there are also uh, quite a bit of overlap with other things, including um, mood stabilizers in bipolar patients, uh, migraines, and a number of other indications also. But very often they are associated with epilepsy. Now, one of the most common anticonvulsants that's used and uh, is Dilantin. At least historically, that's the one that's been used. And Dilantin's is um, also known as phenytoin or hydantoin. And there happens to be a fetal hydantoin syndrome, which involves hypoplasia or hypoossification of the distal phalanges, the fingertips, and cranial facial anom anomalies. Um, so kind of just remember the face and fingertips for phenytoin. Another one of the anticonvulsants is valproic acid. Brand names include Depakote, Depakine. Um, it has a incidence of um, spina bifida that's elevated, uh, but also congenital heart disease. And there are other ones, anticonvulsants, trimethodione, which we rarely see, lamotrigine, which we frequently see because lamictal is a relatively modern medication and we see it a lot. And then carbamazepine or the brand name Tegretol, it may be associated with congenital heart disease. All right. Now, when it comes to alcohol, although 30% of the babies with fetal alcohol syndrome have congenital heart disease, some meta-analyses suggest that there's not a very strong correlation between alcohol and congenital heart disease, and some believe that echo is not indicated. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. That includes, you know, Motrin, which is ibuprofen, Advil, uh, indomethacin, and there's a number of other ones. And the main things that are associated with them are premature closure of the ductus arteriosus. So if you block prostaglandins with these drugs, the prostaglandins can actually keep the ductus open. So if you give these medications, you can get ductal constriction, and the ductus gets more sensitive later in gestation. So Generally, ductal constriction is pretty unusual prior to you know, 24 weeks, but after 26 weeks, it really starts to increase. They're also associated with other things in the uh, neonate, including uh, low urine output, necrotizing enterocolitis, and intracranial hemorrhage, particularly if you use them really late in pregnancy. The angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, which are common used uh, anti-hypertension medications um, have some side effects, well, particularly those causing birth defects, um, and it's mostly congenital heart disease, central nervous system problems. In fact, there is a ACE inhibitor fetopathy in the second and third trimesters um, where it affects the baby's kidney, so you can get oligohydramnios, renal failure, growth restriction, and actually hypocalvaria, you know, the smooth, round part of your skull. SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, there's a bunch of them. Uh, we see them frequently. A lot of people are on them, but at least at the current thinking, fluoxetine or Prozac is the only one on the list where a fetal echo is indicated. Now, it is true that all of the SSRIs do have a potential side effect of causing pulmonary hypertension in the newborn. They tend to, in, the serotonin increases smooth muscle production in the lung around the arterioles, and you can get pulmonary hypertension. So 
that risk is about 1%. Obesity does have a correlation with congenital heart disease and neural tube defect, like spina bifida. But echo is debatable uh, about whether that's indicated. When it comes to prevention of car congenital heart disease, it appears that uh, 800 micrograms or 0.8 milligrams of folic acid, which is the dose that is found in prenatal vitamins, reduces the risk of congenital heart disease by 50%. Um, there's a similar effect in neural tube defects, spina bifida, and for that reason, many people recommend that all women of reproductive age are on prenatal vitamins all the time. All right, let's talk about embryology. Um, not because I think it's that important or that comes up that often in the tests, the studies that we do, um, but it comes up on the boards, so we have to talk about it. So whenever we're talking about embryology, the forming embryo, basically think of it as there's a bunch of cells that are migrating and specializing. Now, these cells can group into different forms. They can form cords, you know, like a rope. Uh, the cords can canalize, meaning they get a canal within, it, within them or a lumen to form a tube from a rope. Um, you can get septations that form within the tubes, um, and then you can get a tube with two lumens um, the tubes can widen to form chambers, and the tubes can twist or loop. And all this stuff happens in the development of the heart. Now, very simply or oversimplified, cardiac formation starts as a tube. There is a venous end and an arterial end. At each end, um, they start to, you know, there starts to be some differentiation. And at the venous end, there's a bunch of veins that form. At the other end, the arterial end, there are two aortas that form also. Now, of all these veins that are kind of forming, uh, some of them are fusing, some of them are regressing. Now, in the middle of the tube, what happens is the tube kinks and the atria kind of move to the back and the ventricles to the front. And when the tube twists toward the right, like you're looking at the baby and it's twisting over to the right of you, um, this puts the right ventricle in the front and the left in the back. And that is called de-looping. D or dextro means right. So the normal twisting and turning that happens in this tube is called de-looping. I don't think you need to understand too much more than that, but really what it is, again, is it's a twisting of the tube that puts what's going to become the right ventricle in the front of the baby and the left ventricle a little bit more toward the back and the atria to the back. So de-looping is the normal thing. The primitive heart tube also starts to divide. So now let's talk about the atrial septation. It's a interesting uh, part of embryology and it seems to be pretty important in understanding atrial septal defects. But first, let's talk about a couple terms. Just review them. A septum is a wall. A foramen is a hole and a fenestration is a window. So I think that fenestra is probably Spanish or Italian for window. Um, and it's also the basis of the word defenestration, which means to throw a person out of a window. But here, we're talking about formation of a window, and it's called fenestration. All right, so atrial septation, think of it as this common atrium, just a a widening of that original tube. And then what happens is you start forming a septum. And this first septum that is going to be formed is the septum primum. 
first septum. And it kind of gets pulled down from the top, like you're pulling down you know, a, a blind uh, on a window. So it's heading from the top and it's heading toward the crux of the heart. The crux of the heart, embryologically, is also called the endocardial cushions. And as it gets um, pulled down and it's not quite closed, there's a hole there called the foramen primum. Now eventually, that's going to go away. But as it's forming and the blind's getting pulled down, the gap is called the foramen primum, or first hole. And eventually the blind will get to the endocardial cushion, but while that's happening, the top of the blind is getting these little tiny holes all over the place up near the top. And those little tiny holes kind of coalesce into one big hole, and that is a fenestration. It's becoming a window, and that now, that is the second hole that forms. The first one was at the bottom, and now we've got this new one up at the top, and that's the foramen secundum, or second wall, or hole, sorry. Atrial septation. All right, the next part of it is after the first blind got pulled all the way down to the crux and little holes coalesced to form a hole up at the top, another blind gets pulled down. And it's inside the right atrium. And in the picture at the right, you can see that lower one, the septum secundum, or second wall, is starting to get pulled down. And it's on its way down, and it, also, it never really quite gets there. You can see over on this slide that we have two septum. The first one is the septum primum. Again, it got pulled down and got fenestrations at the top. And then the second one got pulled down, but never quite got there and left this big gap at the bottom. That big gap at the bottom is called the foramen ovale. Then what happens is you've got these two walls, two walls with holes in different places, and they kind of squish together and fuse. And when they do that, it means that the tunnel between them isn't quite straight. So you go in the bottom of the wall of the septum secundum, and you kind of go upward and out over the flap of the foramen ovale. So basically, the septum primum, that first wall, becomes the flap, and the septum secundum is the wall that has the foramen ovale in it. All right, septation of the ventricles. It's a little bit more complicated because the way the ventricle septum is formed is you have three different regions kind of growing out and fusing together. And since you've got this complicated process um, of fusion of three different regions, it's probably the reason that ventricular septal defects are the most common defects. Basically, you have the muscular septum, that red arrow growing up from the bottom. You have the conal septum, that area up at the top near the great vessels is a conal region, so that's growing down. But then you also have an area of the septum growing from the inlets. You know, the inlets are the basically the between the right atrium and right ventricle and the left atrium and left ventricle. So you have those three regions growing together. While the septation of the ventricles is going on and the atria, you also have septation of the outflow tracts. And the two sections at the arterial end of the tube form two separate canals. So the areas at the arterial end are called the bulbus cordis and the truncus arteriosus, which I don't think you really need to know for sure, but What's going on there is they're kinking, they're dividing, and they're twisting, and that's normally what's supposed to happen. Meanwhile, down at the venous end, there are three 
paired veins and they kind of regress asymmetrically. And the three pairs include the, the vitelline veins, there's a right and left, uh, and those end up becoming the right and left portal veins. So you get both of them still. The umbilical veins, there are two of them, right and left. The right umbilical vein, in most cases, regresses and leaving the left only. The cardinal veins, again, right and left cardinal veins, you get an asymmetric uh, regression. And at the head end, the superior vena cava on the left regresses and the right persists. And at the other end, you get an inferior vena cava, an azygous, and hemizygous, which are these three things draining the lower portion of the baby um, that are asymmetrical. At the other end, again, the arterial system develops from the right and left pharyngeal arteries. And everything starts paired, but then things start to regress. So initially there's a right and left thoracic aorta, kind of in the front, and the right regresses in most cases. We'll see later persistent right aortic arch as an entity, but in most cases it's the right one that goes away and the left persists. persists. The left ductus arteriosus regresses, leaving a right and then in the back of the baby, the right and left dorsal aortas fuse into one single descending aorta. Heart field theory. Well, I don't think you have to know this, but I'm going to throw it in anyway because it's in the book. The old theory said that all cells of the primitive heart tube are pluripotential, meaning any one of the cells be couldn't become any part of the heart. But now the new theory is that there are three fields of different type cells, the first heart field, the second heart field, and the neural crest cells. And the neural crest cells are from ectoderm. Again, I don't think you need to know that. But the point is that neural crest cells are involved in craniofacial bone formation, conotruncal region, and also conduction system formation. And this group of cells of common origin um, can help explain why certain syndromes tend to involve not only the heart, but other things. Um, and a big example, which you're gonna hear about 50 times in the future, is the velocardiofacial syndrome, also known as DeGeorge syndrome, also known as 22Q deletion syndrome. There's a time when they were all thought to be separate things, but they're all kind of the same thing, of same origin. And the features of 22Q deletion, or velocardiofacial syndrome, is heart defects. Uh, not surprisingly, ventricular septal defects, they seem to be everywhere. Conotruncal defects, again, the neural crest cells. Tetralogy of flow, which is kind of an outflow issue, just like conotruncal defects. The vellum, which is the vello part of velocardiofacial, is, refers to the palate, so we can have a cleft palate. Can, but not necessarily. Um, you can get facial abnormalities like a short, flat philtrum, that little area right between your nose and your lip. Um, bulbous nose, hooded eyes, low set ears. Those are the facial characteristics of 22Q deletion. They may also have an absent thymus, that immune gland that's in the front of the top of the baby's chest, right around the three vessel view um, level. And since it's involved in immune function, if it's absent, they have immune problems. The parathyroid glands, also located in that region, right next to the thyroid, um, are involved in calcium metabolism, so these babies can have low calcium. And they also have learning disabilities and mental health issues, including even schizophrenia. All right, let's summarize this embryology. You've got this primitive heart tube that kinks and twists, and the normal kinking and twisting is called de-looping. Septations, fusions, fenestrations, widening, regressions, all these things are occurring. There's three groups of cells, 
first and second fields, and then the neural crest cells. Uh, and they explain why certain heart defects kind of go together and are associated with other things. An example of a neural crest cell defect leading to conotruncal defects with facial and thymus defects is the 21Q11 deletion. Complicated process like the three parts of the ventricular septum fusing are common places for defects and that's why they're the most common entity. Let's talk cardiac anatomy. The heart sits horizontally in the chest. We think of it as kind of standing up with the atria at the top and the ventricles at the bottom, but basically when it's in the fetal chest, it's pretty much horizontal. <clears throat> the crux or cross is in the midline. So a line drawn from the sternum to the vertebra goes right through the crux or pretty close to it. And you can see what that does is it leaves about two thirds of the heart in the left chest and one third in the right. The apex typically points about 45 degree angle to the left, plus or minus 20%. Sitting in front of the great vessels at the top of the heart is the thymus. Behind the heart is this anatomy here on the right, which is basically the back of the baby's rib cage with the heart removed. And you can see that the azygous vein is slightly to the right of the spine, and the aorta is slightly to the left. <clears throat> and that azygous vein back there comes up along the back, and it forms a little arch into the superior vena cava. So basically, you've got the inferior vena cava coming up and goes into the right atrium. The azygous vein goes up the back along the spine and dumps into the superior vena cava, forming a little arch. Here we are looking at the heart valves from up above. And you can see that all of the heart valves have three cusps except for one, the mitral valve. And the reason the mitral valve is called the mitral valve is because it looks like a mitre, or the hat of a bishop, with those two points on it. The annulus refers to the fibrous ring around the valves. You can see in the photograph down below, you've got these wispy, thin little valves, but this thick, fibrous ring, that's the annulus. Looking over at the diagram on the right, what you'll notice is that the aortic valve and the mitral valve are very close to each other. In fact, there's fibrous tissue between them, like the annulus of one is right next to the annulus of the other. And that's what we call fibrous continuity. On the other hand, you can see that the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary artery are way far apart. And the thing between the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valve is myocardium. The aorta leaves the heart, the left ventricle, uh, very close to the AV valves. And it's heading over from the left to the right. So it's kind of going right through the crux and it's on its way over to the right side. And the pulmonary artery, or the pulmonary artery goes up and over that on its way to the left. Therefore, the pulmonary valve is anterior to the aortic valve, and it's slightly to the left. So by the time they've left the heart, the pulmonary artery is partway there on its way to the left, and the aortic valve is partway there on its way to the right. What this is really important for is when we try to understand transposition later on. The anatomy of the right atrium is not particularly complicated. You've got a back part, which is very smooth walled. That's where the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava enter. And then the front, or the appendage, the part that kind of bulges out over the ventricle a little bit, um, is trabeculating, meaning there's ridges of muscle. 
And there's a line between the smooth part and the rough part called the crista terminalis. The right atrium has three veins that empty into it. The superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is that which drains the actual heart muscle itself. The eustachian valve at the bottom of the atrium is really just a ridge of tissue that directs the IVC blood flow at the foramen ovale. So it's coming back, it's coming into the right atrium, but it's specifically pointed right at that hole to go across to the left. The mitral valve. The mitral valve, as we know, has two leaflets. All the rest have three. This one has two. And it has no septal attachment. The tricuspid valve does. It has a septal attachment. One of the leaflets is attached to the septum um, by way of these cordy, tendony, and papillary muscles. But the mitral valve does not have a septal attachment. The ventricular septum uh, has different portions to it. There's the apical, apex meaning point, the tip of the heart at the bottom there is the apex, and that's the muscular portion. The inlet or membranous portion, so it's a very thin part, and it's down at the bottom of the heart where the inlet is, you know, atrium to ventricle, atrium to ventricle on the other side. Then there's the perimembranous part, which is nearby, and it's just under the aorta. And then there's the part that's under the pulmonary artery, and that's called an outlet part of the septum. So those are the portions of the septum, and they're going to be the portions of the ventricular septal defects. Let's quickly review the veins of the heart. Remember, um, the veins that empty into the right atrium are the IVC, the SVC, and the coronary sinus. And in the picture at right, we're looking at the bottom of the heart. So you can see that the coronary veins draining the ventricles themselves, the muscle, drain into a vessel called the coronary sinus, and the coronary sinus comes along the bottom of the heart and drains into the right atrium. The coronary arteries, that's the blood supply, comes from the aortic root. So in the picture down below, you can see the aortic valve, and right above the valve are the two coronary arteries that come off right there. So they are above the valve, and the arteries come out at the top. And again, the veins drain and go in the bottom. Arteries come out the top, supply the heart. Blood drains back into the coronary sinus on the bottom of the heart. All right, let's talk genetics because it's on the test. All right, so I'm going to try to oversimplify this topic. Uh, genetics is a very complicated topic, and I'm just going to try to simplify it. Um, maybe a little too much, but here it is. The way to think of it is uh, three categories of genetic abnormalities. Um, those detected by karyotype, that's where you look at all the chromosomes in the photograph. Two, microdeletions and duplications that are detected by chromosomal microarray. And then the last category is single gene defects, and they are detected by exome sequencing. So I'll get into each one of these. First one, karyotype. Basically what happens is you take a bunch of cells that are dividing, and during metaphase, when they're all lined up in the middle, you kind of stop them right there and take a picture, and then you take those photographs and arrange them. And basically, you're able to see you know, the number of chromosomes to see if there's extra ones or ones missing. And you can detect deletions, but they have to be really big at that point. So uh, examples of karyotype abnormalities are autosomal trisomies. So autosomes are the all the rest of the chromosomes besides the sex chromosomes. So everything besides X and Y. 
Um, so the autosomal trisomies, the most common, are trisomy 21, 13, and 18. And monosomy X, where you only have 45 chromosomes and just one sex chromosome, an X. You can actually also have Kleinfelters, 46 XXY, or triploidy, which is three sets. Instead of two sets of chromosomes adding up to 46, you have three sets adding up to 69. And then you can pick up very large deletions like wolf hershorn which is a 4P minus, and Kudyashat, which is a portion of the P arm um, on number five that's missing. All right. The next thing is chromosomal microarray, um, also called comparative genomic hybridization. And what that does is it looks for all the small deletions, microdeletions, and duplications. An example is DeGeorge syndrome, velocardiofacial syndrome, or 22Q deletion. <clears throat> now, that chromosomal microarray, or CGH, um, is looking for all these little deletions in the chromosomes. You can also look for a deletion using the non-invasive prenatal testing if you're going to look specifically for one in particular. Um, so it's very common for actually NIPT to add on looking specifically for the 22Q deletion. Um, they will be able to tell if there's a whole chromosome missing too, just like the karyotype. So microarray, chromosomal microarray, or this hybridization, um, basically, you can see out of 100 cases, 14% um, of the ones with congenital heart disease have an abnormal chromosome problem. So that'll be detected by the karyotype. The next thing is an additional 6% are going to be picked up by this chromosomal microarray. And the things that it picks up are called pathogenic copy number variants. So um, of those that the chromosomal microarray picks up, of that 6%, half of them are going to be 22Q. And the other half is all the rest of them. So obviously 22Q is the most common one that you can pick up. But just remember, after you've already excluded aneuploidy, you can still pick up 6%. All right, the next one is exome sequencing, also called next generation sequencing, also called massively parallel sequencing. And basically, the whole exome sequencing is looking at all the genes. And there, you can actually look for single gene defects. So an example is cystic fibrosis. There's one you know, mutated gene. Um, and that is picked up by exome sequencing. Now, when we do the carrier screening of the, mother, the mothers, uh, we offer that at the first trimester, uh, basically, they've picked down 112 genes. They didn't go for all of them. They basically picked down 112 uh, to put on a panel. All right, and let's talk NIPT, or non-invasive prenatal testing, also called cell-free fetal DNA. And cell-free fetal DNA is a bunch of DNA that gets thrown off by the placenta, it's just little fragments floating around. It doesn't last very long in maternal circulation. But while it's out there, it can be um, put into little categories um, you know, for each chromosome. And it has a detection rate for trisomy 21 of about 99%, which is really good. If you check off that you want it to look for 22Q11 deletion, um, it's okay, but it's only 70%. But point is you can actually look for 22Q with an NIPT. All right. Whenever you're talking about congenital heart disease and aneuploidy, aneuploidy means not good chromosomes or not good number of chromosomes, um, it's often hard to tell what the risk is. Um, 
the percentages are all over the place. And one of the reasons is that the risk of a chromosome problem is higher in fetuses than it is in newborns. And the reason for that is a lot of the fetuses with abnormal chromosomes die. In fact, Turner syndrome, 45 X, monosomy X, has a 75% mortality in utero. So most of those babies don't make it to term. Trisomy 18 has a pretty high loss rate, so does trisomy 13. And for trisomy 21, Down syndrome, 30% of them um, die in utero. All right. Well, when it comes to chromosome problems, that first category, um, they have a higher association with right-sided lesions. Trisomy 21, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, more than half of them have congenital heart disease, and they can have a lot of different things. Um, certainly, they're known for having atrioventricular ventricular septal defects, but other things too, like ventricular septal defects, tetralogy of Fallot. And keep in mind <clears throat> that Down syndrome is the number one cause of heart defects and intellectual disabilities. So the combination of heart defect, intellectual disabilities, Down syndrome is the number one cause of that. And here's a, um, a little group of pictures showing you some of the extra cardiac abnormalities like a wide pelvis, short femurs, um, they can have the increase uh, nuchal skin fold. They can have pyelectasis. They can have duodenal atresia. Uh, they also have cranio, cranial and facial markers, um, including you know absent nasal bone, uh, the thickness of the skin in the front of the head can be increased. The cavum septum pellucidum uh, can be dilated. Um, and nuchal edema too. Trisomy 18. Well, even more of those fetuses have congenital heart disease, 80% or more. And ventricular septal defect is the most common. And if you're never really sure of what the association is, you can guess VSD. But we'll try to go over all the specific ones for all the different things they might ask you. But basically, ventricular septal defects and outflow tract anomalies are common with trisomy 18. Keep in mind that ventricular septal defect with trisomy 18, and almost no matter what the problem is, um, they often include a ventricular septal defect. So you can have a hypoplastic right heart, but also a ventricular septal defect. Here's a slide of some of the extra cardiac findings uh, with trisomy 18. So omphalocele is a big one. Um, you can have clinodactyly. You can have rocker bottom feet, which I don't think is in this picture, but it can be there. And then other things that are very nonspecific, single umbilical artery, neural tube defect. Um, so these aneuploidies, you know, the autosomal trisomies, 21 and 18, you know, they can have multiple things associated with them. But very frequently when it comes to tests, they pick the ones that are somewhat pathognomonic. Pathognomonic means it definitely goes with that and it kind of only goes with that. Um, none of these things are pathognomonic, but Anytime you are presented with um, a fetus on the test with duodenal atresia or nuchal thickening or an atrioventricular septal defect, certainly be thinking of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. Same thing for trisomy 18 or Edwards syndrome. The things that tend to go along with it that are really should make you think of that are the omphalocele and the clinodactyly and also rocker bottom feet tend to go along with that too. Trisomy 13, or Patel syndrome, those, the ones that are very often associated that really should make you think trisomy 13, are basically 
brain abnormalities of the midline like holoprosencephaly and facial abnormalities of the midline like clefting and also polydactyly. So cleft lip, polydactyly, holoprosencephaly, be thinking trisomy 13. Monosomy X or Turner syndrome, the things that kind of go along with that are typically the cystic hygroma and the coarctation of the aorta. All right, let's talk micro deletions and duplications. That's the second, second category. The first category was just problems with the big chromosomes themselves. Now we're talking about little teeny pieces of chromosome either missing or duplicated. DeGeorge syndrome, the synonym is velocardiofacial syndrome or 22Q11 deletion is the number one micro deletion. It accounts for 50% of the micro deletions, and it is not detected by a karyotype. The karyotype is that one where you put all those big chromosomes you know, on a photograph and arrange them. Now you can use FISH. FISH is basically where you fluorescent in situ hybridization, where you take a little tag and that has a color associated with it and you mix it with the cells and they don't even have to divide you can just use it on nine dividing cells which is why it can be done so quickly um, and if you have this 22q11 marker for that area um, you can detect it with fish um, you can also use microarray and microarray is again the one that looks uh, at all the chromosomes for little bits and pieces that are duplicated or missing. Um, and then lastly, as I said before, you can use NIPT, um, but it's not very sensitive. DeGeorge syndrome has certain cardiac findings that are typical, and they are basically, think of like the outflow tracts, particularly the conotruncal region um, where the aorta is formed. And so conotruncal anomalies kind of include things like uh, an interrupted aortic arch or a common arterial trunk or truncus arteriosus. The non-cardiac findings, again, are the absent thymus, is why, which is why they have immune problems, um, a long bulbous nose, might be hard for us to find, or dilated cavum septum pellucidum. That's also one of the things that's on the list for Down syndrome, but yeah, it's on the DeGeorge syndrome as well. Now, as I said, the DeGeorge syndrome or 22Q deletion is the most common micro deletion and it involves about 40 genes. So some things like cystic fibrosis, we're talking about a single gene, but this DeGeorge syndrome micro deletion includes a whole bunch of genes. And we said that Down syndrome was the number one cause of congenital heart disease and intellectual disabilities. The number two cause of that combo of congenital heart disease and intellectual disability is DeGeorge syndrome, or 22Q. I'll throw in a couple other micro deletions only because they're in Dr. Abu Hamid's book. Uh, an example is the Williams. Buren syndrome, um, which is basically these elf-like facies and uh, some supravalvular and pulmonic stenosis. There's another one, uh, which is the 1P36 syndrome, only listing that because it's the number two deletion after 22Q. And there it's kind of known for its cardiomyopathy and Epstein anomaly. Those are the only two other micro deletions I'm going to talk about. So the only ones we've talked about are 22Q and then 1P36 and Williams Buren syndrome. All right, the last category is the single gene disorders. Now they can be detected with something called whole exome sequencing. Now, one of the problems with whole exome sequencing, where you're looking at a, you know, lots and lots and lots of genes is you can detect some variations and we're not really sure what they mean. And they're called VOUS or 
variance of unknown significance. Um, so what will happen is instead of looking at everything and be kind of being saddled with a bunch of information that you're not sure how to, to interpret, what they'll do is they'll narrow it down and just look for certain things. So they sometimes will group them together in a cardiac panel. Um, so here's an example from you know, a commercial company and it's from Invitee congenital heart disease panel and you can see what they do is they picked a bunch of genes and they look for it and then they tell you over there on the right what ones they're looking for so all of those ones on the right are single gene disorders that are picked up by this technique all right you can see one of them is called the charge syndrome so charge syndrome is a single gene defect not a chromosome problem, not a deletion of part of a chromosome, it's a single gene problem. And the CHARGE syndrome is an acronym that stands for coloboma, and coloboma of the iris or retina just means there's a chunk missing. That's what the pictures on the right are. Chunk missing of the iris, and, but you can also have a chunk missing of the retina. The H is for heart defect, and very commonly, and I think you have to know this, is that the heart defect with CHARGE syndrome is tetralogy of flow and conotruncal, things that involve those outflow tracts. The A stands for coanal atresia. Coanal it talks about the nasal passages, so you can have atresia of your nasal passages. And then growth restriction, obviously we're stretching this acronym here. The R is the restriction part. Uh, G for genital anomalies, and E for ear anomalies or deafness. So <clears throat> here I've got this picture of the test from the Ultrasound Registry Review. And I took the test, and actually I got this wrong, um, but... Um, I took the test and I'm going to be giving you these um, test questions to give you just another thing besides the Alfred Abu Hamid book. Um, but here it was where they asked what the, the problem was with this single gene disorder of charge syndrome, what type of problem it was. Uh, I didn't know, so I guessed the most common thing, which is septal defects, and I was wrong, and it is a conotruncal abnormality. So think of that big C for charge and big C for conotruncal, or tetralogy of Fallot. All right, let's talk about another single gene defect. This one is called the Kabuki syndrome, and apparently it gets its name from Kabuki theater, which is that Japanese type of theater where they have these characters with this very heavy makeup and facial expressions. And I guess they applied that to children with that who had very distinctive uh, facial expressions or characteristics. So it's a single gene. There's facial dysmorphism. Their cardiac problems tend to be left-sided obstructive lesions, you know, like aortic stenosis, aortic atresia, and there also are some skeletal abnormalities too. The next single gene disorders that we're going to talk about is Noonan syndrome. Now, Noonan used to be a distinct entity, but now it's grouped in with this other bunch of things called the rasopathies. So basically, there is a mutation in a single gene in over 50% of the babies with Noonan's, but sometimes it's a different one. Um, but the point is, a whole bunch of genes can be involved. And what they all do is, what they have in common is they involve a disorder of a certain enzyme. The enzyme happens to be called the RAS mitogen activated protein kinase or MAPK and this enzyme pathway is very important in developing organs so if you have a mutation in an enzyme 
pathway, meaning a pathway that involves a whole bunch of enzymes, um, it can affect you know, certain parts of embryology. So this enzyme pathway is affected by about 40 different genes. And there are a whole bunch of different, I guess, diseases that you can get. Um, and they're very similar to Noonan's um, because there's a problem with a gene. One of these 40 genes is a problem. Now, if you have a mutation in one gene out of those 40, and then there's another mutation in somebody else in a different gene, um, but it's the same pathway, they have pretty similar overlapping embryologic effects. Um, and examples of these rasopathies include Noonan syndrome. Uh, there's a couple others, there's actually a long list of others, but the other ones that may be included in this group include Costello syndrome, Leopard syndrome, craniofaciocutaneous syndrome. Um, and one of the examples of an overlapping finding in all four of those is that they can all have an abnormal ductus venosus in the first trimester. This is just an example of one of the things that overlaps. All right, another single gene defect is Holt-Oram, also called heart and hand. So there's a mutation of this one gene, the TBX5 gene, um, this tends to be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, meaning if one of the parents has it and passes it on, the baby will get it with just one of the parents passing it on. Now, a lot of these autosomal dominant things, you know, like achondroplasia and Holt-Oram, um, 30 to 40 percent of the time, or even more with other things, um, it's brand new. Neither parent has it. So it's a de novo or new mutation. Now from then on in, it'll be inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. But for a bunch of these cases, there is no parent who has it. It's brand new. And when it comes to Holt-Oram's cardiac defects, ASDs and VSDs, again, if you can't remember what exactly the thing that goes along with it, VSD is always a good guess. Uh, but they also have these skeletal problems, particularly hand, like an absent thumb, absent radius. Um, Focomelia is when the whole limb is small, um, but thumb and radius, that radius bone and the thumb, they're basically kind of the same thing almost. They're both on the same side. And then the other thing about them is a long triphalangeal thumb. So normally you have three phalanges in all your other fingers, but your thumb only has two. But the these babies with Holt or Ram can have a three flange thumb, and you can see in the picture down below the thumb's really long. Another single gene disorder is allergial syndrome, and basically it involves a broad forehead and a pointed chin. And actually, whenever I look at these pictures, um, even though I see the characteristics they're talking about, I don't think I would have figured out if I saw this person on the street that there's anything wrong. But also, they're associated with right-sided heart defects, and they also have a paucity of bile ducts. Um, tuberous sclerosis. Uh, again, we're talking single gene disorders. Tuberous sclerosis, you know, there often is a, uh, a family history. One of the parents has it, um, and it's autosomally dominantly inherited in a third of the cases. But two-thirds of the cases are brand new, de novo. And basically, they involve the mutation of one of these two genes. Now, tuberous sclerosis complex involves some cardiac findings. Um, well, actually, the one that we all are aware of is cardiac rhabdomyomas. So whenever you see a rhabdomyoma, you're thinking tuberous sclerosis. Um, but this tuberous sclerosis complex involves like tumors 
a lot of other places too, not just the heart. You can have them in the brain and associated seizures, you can have kidney tumors, you can have facial myofibromas, and they do come with cafe or spots, skin spots, and learning disabilities too. All right, so let's talk about familial recurrence of car congenital heart disease while we're here in the genetics chapter. Um, 30% of congenital heart disease is genetic that we're aware of, and the other 70% is isolated or non-syndromic. Of the stuff that's genetic, well, it depends on what about it. Is it an autosomal dominant? Is it autosomal recessive? Is it a, a deletion? Is it a chromosome problem? It depends on what it is to figure out recurrence. But in the ones where you don't know the genetic basis, there is a 3 to 5% recurrence, which is a little on the high side. And it does seem that folic acid seems to reduce this recurrence rate. Here's a picture or of a, um, one of the test questions from the ultrasound registry review, which basically said, which of the following has been shown to reduce the risk of congenital heart defects? And the answer is folic acid supplements. The familial reoccurrence for congenital heart disease is 3 to 5 percent, but depending on what it is, it could be a little bit higher or lower. For example, hypoplastic left heart syndromes among the higher ones, which is um, if someone has a baby with hypoplastic left heart syndrome, there's a 13.5 percent chance that you'll find it in a sibling. Another thing that affects this recurrence rate is who's got it, which parent has it. And as you can see from this table for all these things, um, if the mother has the heart defect, it's more likely to affect the baby than if the father is the one that has it. Genetic counseling should always be offered. So 70% of the congenital heart disease is not genetic, at least not that we know of. So you should be thinking of other things besides genetics like diabetes, medication exposure, infection exposure, and a bunch, you know, we never figure it out. And then when it comes to the 30% that's genetic, we have to go through those three categories and think chromosomal, think microdeletions, particularly 22Q, and then think single gene defects, including things like Noonan syndrome.